diagnosis because it means substance abuse and mental health in the same person. Okay, so the person's been diagnosed with both. Some people call it co-occurring disorders, which is also COD. So if ever you hear those three different terms, and there's two more terms too that I'll introduce to you a little later on, we're talking about someone with a dual diagnosis with substance abuse and mental illness. Okay. Um, what we're going to talk about today is defined evidence-based practice. We're going to talk about substance abuse and mental health disorders. We're going to talk about what co-occurring disorders are and how prevalent they are and how serious they are. So a little more serious than either one of the other two. We're also going to talk about how co-occurring disorders have been approached in the past and how beneficial those approaches were versus the new approaches that are operating today, which you would probably be a part of if you decided to go into this field. We're also going to talk about common problems faced by consumers with co-occurring disorders. So how are their symptoms different from somebody with a mental illness versus someone with a substance abuse disorder. We're going to describe integrated care because that is the big difference now. Integrated care versus separate care. We're going to look at categories of treatment programs, principles and practice of standards. We're going to look at medication issues and examples of best practice for dual diagnosis. We're going to discuss recovery, and then we're going to have questions and comments. So that's an awful lot to do in today's lecture, so I assume that it's going to spill over for the next session, too. Um, but if you have any questions along the way, just ask me, and I'm going to be asking you questions along the way, too. Okay. So the first thing I want to know is what your impression of evidence-based practice is. Anybody want to give a definition or what you think goes into it? It'd be something like, say, if it's a group that's been shown results and that they've actually done studies on and monitored over time. Good. So it's a treatment group, right? That's mm -hmm. what you mean by group? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So somebody's monitoring it. Who would be monitoring it to see if it's working or not? Could be the principal investigator. So it could be a researcher that's decided to study it. Um, would it ever be the clinician? that's running the group? Yeah. Could be, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It could be someone else, it could be their boss, it could be the facility wants to look at itself and just to see what's working or what isn't working within the facility. It might be one OT group that you're gonna look at, it might be many other kinds of groups, interdisciplinary groups. So good, um, that's a component of it. Anything else that you know about it? Evidence like so Evidence-based practice? Not yet? Okay. And I'm going to go all the way back and I'll just explain it. Um, a long time ago, OTs worked in a lot of um, practice areas like mental health. And not all of these practice areas were fully researched. So OTs would work in mental health and maybe there weren't a lot of publications that were written. and Throughout the years, clinicians got really good at doing what they were doing, but they didn't necessarily publish how they did it. And it got passed on, you know, from supervisor to supervisee, and that's how people learn how to do occupational therapy and mental health. Um, but there are many publications now. So how did we get from there to having many publications? There's a big emphasis now on people documenting, clinicians documenting what they do and whether or not it works. And if it doesn't work, to tweak it and keep working with the procedures until they work. So that's what evidence-based practice is. It's a practice that's done in the clinic by, you name the discipline, OT, PT, nursing, doesn't matter. Um, and it's, it's been shown to have outcomes that have been studied and have been effective. In fact, maybe more effective than no treatment or other types of treatment. So that's evidence-based practice. That's what you're going to be using when you look at your research. And that's the kind of project you're going to be doing is adding evidence-based practice to the field of OT when you do your research. Not all research is evidence-based. Now, practice is evidence-based. 
Okay. Um, when you did your affiliations, or when you're in your affiliations now, how many people would say that you use evidence-based practices in your affiliations for level one? Anybody? Then what I want you to do is to ask your supervisor, do you do, does she or he use evidence-based practice in that setting that you're in? And if so, ask them what it is. Okay? And then you can let me know next week. <laughs> um, so what you're looking for is you want to practice in a way that you're looking at the highest level of scientific evidence. And that's usually a randomized control study, which you'll learn about later. It's not a case study, but it has a large amount of subjects in the study, and there's a control group to compare some kind of intervention with a control group. It could be someone that has no intervention, or it could be um, another kind of treatment group. Like if you wanted to compare cognitive behavioral therapy with behavioral therapy using <laughs> substance abuse clients, you could do that. You could have a treatment set up for each one, and then you can compare the results for both. You could look at clean time, and you can look at psychiatric disorders if you wanted to work with the diagnosis. Okay? So that would be evidence-based. Um, not all practices are evidence-based, right? What could be some reason why you would be practicing with evidence-based practice? Yes. Yes. If it's a new treatment, there might not be anything out there. But you as a clinician might know that it really works, right? Okay. So that would fall under, like, emerging practices. Right, practices that are innovative and haven't been fully researched yet. And there are also promising practices, which are um, maybe not just one person does, but a lot of people do, and they just haven't been written up yet. So good. You can't always use best practice, but whenever you can, you should. And that leaves a lot of room for you guys to do research, because that, that you know, is really necessary. Um, so what is mental illness? Uh, does anybody have a copy of the DSM now, the new one? Do you know what we're up to now in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistics Guide? Five, right, good. So you know that it's out there. You can look it up now. There are a lot of different things between the four TR and the five, but basically the definition of mental illness is the same. It's clinically significant behavioral problems in a person it's associated with distress, such as painful symptoms. Um, it causes disability, which is an impairment in functioning. And it's a biological illness that responds to treatment, and it's not to be confused with weakness of character. Okay, so that's how the DSM-5 defines mental illness. Now, facts about mental illness. It has nothing to do with intelligence. As you know from your level one field work that it transcends intelligence. It can happen to anyone. It's chronic but not contagious. Um, not all mental illnesses are chronic, but many of them are. It's difficult to diagnose and treat. It's treatable, but not so much curable. But in some cases it is, like depression and anxiety in some people can be curable. People with mental illnesses are not all dangerous. And I think you've read in the paper, right? There was just something, or I saw it on CNN. Did anyone see that? on CNN yesterday. There's a whole like 60 minute special about people that have mental illnesses. And it was a psychiatrist that was talking about how he knows of a lot of people that just refuse treatment. And they're very symptomatic and they have a lot of um, thoughts about killing themselves and killing other people, but yet they can't be forced into treatment. So he was talking about how we're not doing them a service by letting them have their psychosis and, and not forcing them into treatment. And that was his opinion. But all in all, people that are medicated with mental illness are not any more dangerous. And they shouldn't be confused with such terms as psychopath or sociopath. Because, you know, people that are depressed are not sociopathic or psychopaths. People with schizophrenia have a specific illness with specific symptoms that has nothing to do with the split personality or being a psychopath or a sociopath. Yet, a sociopathic person um, can be diagnosed as a sociopath with the DSM-IV. 
<laughs> Substance related disorders all have to do with taking drugs and abusing drugs. There are side effects 